Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, it is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you all this evening to the Hampstead Synagogue online for the 18th annual Isaiah Berlin Lecture. The first when we have not been able to meet together in person, but as a silver lining, a lecture that will be heard by even more people than usual and which will cross international boundaries. A word of background about this annual lecture. Sir Isaiah Berlin was a member of our synagogue, the family's membership having begun when his parents joined in the 1920s. After Sir Isaiah's death in 1997, we were privileged to provide the venue for a very special memorial service. But we felt that Sir Isaiah's connection with our shul should be marked in a more permanent way as well. And we therefore approached Lady Berlin and the members of Sir Isaiah's family to ask if they would agree to our synagogue holding an annual lecture in Sir Isaiah's memory. We were delighted and honoured when they consented, and we thank in particular Sir Isaiah's stepson, our dear friend, Mr. Peter Halben, for his close cooperation in making the many arrangements for the lectures each year. We also thank Zaki Cooper for his immense hard work, dedication and expertise in helping to organise each of the lectures and in securing an 18-year series of truly outstanding, eminent and world-class lecturers. This year, of course, Professor Philippe Sands. This year's lecture, friends, is taking place just a few days before Hanukkah. The timing is fortuitous since Sir Isaiah's thought resonates with some key themes of the festival. Above all, perhaps, Sir Isaiah's warning, so relevant in our contemporary world, that what he terms positive as opposed to negative liberty can lead to the subjugation of minorities and to totalitarian intolerance of dissenting ideas, reminds us of the Maccabees' brave struggle to maintain a minority Jewish culture under threat from Greco-Syrian persecution. So warm welcome, friends, and I now hand over to Mr. Peter Halden. Thank you, Rabbi Michael. On behalf of Isaiah Berlin's family, I would like to express our deepest gratitude to Philip Sands for so kindly agreeing to deliver this year's lecture in the most extraordinary circumstances. We greatly look forward to hearing your talk as we feel that you and Isaiah share many similar preoccupations. I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank Rabbi Michael Harris, Madeleine Abramson, Henry Grunwald, Gabriel Herman, and Zaki Cooper for the exceptional efforts they all made this year to enable us to continue this wonderful tradition. Thank you, and over to Zaki Cooper. Thank you, Peter, for those words, and moreover, the support you and your family have given the Berlin Lecture over the past 18 years. The lecture has been a true partnership between the Berlin family and Hampstead Synagogue. Rabbi Harris, whom we heard from earlier, recently celebrated his 25th anniversary leading our community, so a big muzzle top on that. We cannot let tonight pass without mentioning the sad passing of Rabbi Lord Sachs, who gave the first Isaiah Berlin lecture back in 2003, an inspiring occasion which is still remembered. When Gordon Brown addressed us at last year's memorable event, very few would have predicted one of the audience members, Sir Keir Starmer, would have become leader of the Labour Party several months later. Even fewer, if anyone, would have predicted a global pandemic which has had such devastating health, economic and social consequences. I'm not sure what Isaiah Berlin would have made of the predicament we find ourselves in today, but I do know that his ideas of freedom and liberty, the balance between the individual and the state, 
are as relevant to contemporary debates as ever. Ladies and gentlemen, on to this evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Philippe Sands QC. Philippe is a leading expert on international law, one of the most eminent barristers in the country and a celebrated author to boot. After attending UCS school, not far from our synagogue and then Cambridge University, he was called to the bar in 1985. He became a QC in 2003 and now practices from matrix chambers. He has appeared before many international courts, too numerous to mention. He co-directs the project on international courts and tribunals at London University and New York University. He is the author of 17 books on international law. His book, East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, has been awarded numerous prizes, including the prestigious Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction in 2016. His latest book published this year is The Rat Line, Love, Lies and Justice on the Trial of a Nazi Fugitive. We are delighted that Philippe has agreed to give this year's lecture entitled East and West to the Rat Line and Beyond on Memory and Identity. Without any further ado, over to you, Philippe. Thank you very much. Um, I am deeply honoured and privileged to give uh, this Isaiah Berlin lecture, the 18th uh, in a series. And my thanks, deep thanks go, of course, to colleagues at the Hampstead Synagogue and Peter Halban and Halban Publishers, and to you too, uh, Zaki. And through you, my thanks also to your father, because it was his book uh, on the life of uh, Raphael Lemkin, which in a sense got me going on some of this work. I didn't know Isaiah Berlin, of course, but, but I'm familiar, very familiar with some of his writings and also of his life story. Uh, I know in particular about his ideas on liberty and the great significance he ascribed to the place of individuals in the making of history. And so the subject that I'll address today, the place of memory and identity and their co-relationship are very much inscribed in his thinking. Some of you will have read my book, East West Street, and perhaps a few also the sequel, The Rat Line. The stories they tell, like many of the cases in which I'm involved, inevitably involve personal stories. And what I'm interested in is that connection between the minutiae of the personal story and the larger canvas of the political or public story. That's what interests me. East West Street and the Rat Line are, of course, part of a broader project. My connection with Nicholas Frank and Horst Wächter, the sons of two leading Nazis who were directly involved in the extermination of my grandfather's own family, came about entirely unexpectedly. I wasn't looking for personal stories. In the 1960s, my brother and I would often visit our grandparents in Paris near the Gare du Nord and his children we understood that the past was painful and that we shouldn't ask too many questions. Their apartment was in a way a place of silences, one that was haunted by secrets. But those silences only really began to be addressed for me when I was in my 50th year, when I received an invitation to deliver a lecture in Lviv in the Ukraine. Come and talk about the cases you were involved in on crimes against humanity and genocide. I went to Lviv and one thing led to another. I looked for and found the house where my grandfather Leon was born in 1904. And I learned of the terrible events that occurred in that city, unleashed by the words of Hans Frank, governor general of Nazi occupied Poland, spoken on a warm summer's day in 1942 and directed in the front row of the aula of the university to his deputy, Otto Wächter, who had recently been transferred to Lemberg to serve as the new governor of District Galicia. It was Hans Frank's words in a way that would lead to the extermination of my grandfather's family and hundreds of thousands of other families, including no doubt those of many of the people who are listening this evening. Frank was charged with crimes against humanity and genocide at Nuremberg, and he was hanged 75 years ago in the courtyard of the Palace of Justice for crimes against humanity. I learned in my researches that the man who put crimes against humanity into international law, Hirsch Lauterpacht, came from Lviv. 
Indeed, he was a student at its university, although those who'd invited me to visit were blissfully unaware of this fact. And then I learned that the man who invented the word genocide, Raphael Lemkin, also passed through the city of Lviv and studied at the same law faculty. And again, amazingly, those who invited me were not aware of the fact. And then I learned that at Nuremberg, it was Lauterpacht and Lemkin who prosecuted Hans Frank, respectively, for crimes against humanity and genocide. But when the trial opened, they did not know that the man they were prosecuting was responsible for the deaths of their entire families. Six years after that first visit to Lviv, I published East West Street on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity. It wasn't about the life of one individual, but four. And it seeks to understand how the particular circumstances of each of the four men contributed to the roads that he took and how the roads they traveled, the different roads, changed the system of international law that is my daily work and the daily work of so many others. But of course, as many of you will know, the book also touches a far more personal theme, how these four interweaving lives influenced my own path. And below my path lurk, as for everyone's paths, some pretty big questions, questions that touch each of us and are of interest to each of us, that address central questions of identity. Who am I? How do I wish to be defined as an individual or as a member of one or more groups? And how do we want the law to protect us as individuals or because we're a member of a group? It was probably my work as a barrister rather than my writings that caused the invitation to be sent from Lviv. In the summer of 98, I was peripherally involved in the negotiations in Rome that led to the creation of the International Criminal Court, a body that would have jurisdiction over genocide and crimes against humanity, as well as two other crimes. The essential difference between these two concepts, genocide and crimes against humanity, is on who is protected and why. Assume that 10,000 people are killed, murdered, exterminated. The systematic killing of such huge numbers of individuals will always be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? That depends on the intentions of the killers and the ability of prosecutors to prove that intention. To establish the crime of genocide, you must show that the act of killing is motivated by a special intention, namely the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. If a criminal prosecutor can't prove that a large number of, been, of people have been killed with that intent, then the crime of genocide under international law is not established. And so you have the two crimes operating side by side and overlapping. Every genocide will also be a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity will be a genocide. A few weeks after the two crimes were inscribed into the statute of the International Criminal Court, Senator Pinochet was arrested in London on charges both of genocide and crimes against humanity, laid by a Spanish prosecutor. The House of Lords ruled that even as a former president of Chile, he was not entitled to claim immunity from the English courts, and that was a novel and revolutionary judgment. And in the years that followed, the gates of international justice creaked open after five decades of quiescence. Cases from the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda soon landed on my desk in London, and others followed, relating to allegations in many places like Congo, Libya, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Sierra Leone, Guantanamo, and Iraq. They were always based on the new rules that came into being after 1945, a revolutionary moment in the making of modern international law, a moment that began in courtroom 600 of Nuremberg's palace of justice, when it was recognized that the rights of the sovereign over its people was no longer unlimited. The long and sad list of cases that reached me reflected the failure of good intentions aired in courtroom 600, and I became involved in far too many cases of mass killing. Some were about crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals on a large scale, and others gave rise to allegations of genocide the destruction of groups. These two distinct crimes with their emphases respectively on the individual and the group grew side by side. Although over time, genocide seems to have emerged in the eyes of many as the crime of crimes. 
This is unfortunate. The hierarchy suggests that the killing of a large number of individuals rather than as a group was somehow less terrible. One of the characters in East West Street is Hans Frank's son, Nicholas. He is a fine journalist and he despises his father. The first time I met him, he said to me, Philippe, you know, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. Shortly, he introduced me to Horst Arthur Wächter, the son of his father's deputy, Otto Wächter, who was an Austrian and like his father, also a lawyer. He was governor of Krakow and later governor of District Galicia, based in Lemberg. Wächter, the father, Otto, was indicted for mass murder, the killing of more than 100,000 Poles and Jews. But unlike Hans Frank, he was never caught. He died in Rome in 1949, in mysterious and unexpected circumstances. You will like Horst, Nicholas tells me, but he is different from me. He loves his father. And so in the spring of 2012, I make the first of many visits to Horst, to the dilapidated 12th century castle in the village of Hagenberg, north of Vienna. Horst is in his early 70s. He's genial and chatty. He's dressed in a pink shirt and he wears Birkenstocks. We talk, we eat, we drink. He speaks of his parents, of their Nazi beliefs and of his deep love for his mother, Charlotte. She was a Nazi until the day she died. Horst's wife, Jacqueline, will whisper in my ear. And she was also a childhood of plenty. I was a Nazi child, Horst says to me with a smile. And he's named in honor of the Horst Vessel song and Arthur Seiss Ingvart, who ran Austria after the Anschluss and later became governor of German occupied Holland. Arthur Seiss Ingvart was Horst's godfather. He has a photograph of his godfather who was hanged at Nuremberg along with Hans Frank next to his bed. Horst says to me, I hardly knew my father, but it is my duty as a son to find the good in him. On that first visit, nearly a decade ago, Horst shares albums with me filled with black and white photographs from the 1930s and the 1940s. Images of family holidays on a lake or a mountain interspersed with the occasional swastika, a picture of Hitler, a haunting photograph of a child in the Warsaw Ghetto. The scrapbook makes clear that the Wächter sat at the top Nazi table. And there's a huge collection of his parents' diaries and letters, as well as Charlotte's reminiscences written in due course. But these I will only see much later. I leave at the end of that first visit, intrigued by Horst and his papers. And as Nicholas suggested, I do like him, even if I don't share his views. A year passes. I write a profile of Horst for the Financial Times. It's called My Father, the Good Nazi. Horst doesn't like it. He severs relations with me, but then returns. The article catalyzes a commission for a BBC documentary film, My Nazi Legacy, which traces my relationship with Nicholas and Horst and takes the three of us to Lemberg. Horst doesn't like the film either. Once again, severs our relationship, once again returns for more. But one scene in the film irritates him deeply. In Lviv, at the archives, Nicholas wonders aloud whether Horst might be a new type of Nazi. Indeed, Nicholas later retracts the charge. Horst wants to counter the claim. I don't think of you as a Nazi, I say to him. And he's not. He's not a Holocaust denier. He's not anti-Semitic. He asks me, how can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? I reflect on this interesting and slightly complicated question. To prove a negative I know in court is never easy. Why not give all of the materials to a museum, to scholars, so that others who are interested can review all the material? It seems to be a unique collection, one that traces the life of a leading Nazi couple from the moment they met in 1929 to Otto's death two decades later. Horst agrees. He offers the material to the United States Holocaust Museum. 
and basically it is digitized and made public. Two weeks later, two weeks ago, in fact, it was made available on the museum's website. And so any of you can dip into it and take a look. Just Google Horst Vechter or Vechter Archive, uh, US Holocaust Museum. Would I like a set of the materials? Horst says to me. Yes, I would. A few days later, a single USB stick drops through my letterbox in North London. 13 gigabytes of digital images, 8,677 pages of letters, postcards, diaries, photographs, news clippings, and other official documents. The collection is remarkable. It includes Charlotte's reminiscences written for Horst and the couple's five other children, grouped by time period, 1938 to 1942, 1942 to 1945, and so on. There are also sound recordings, 14 old cassette tapes digitized, which allow me to hear Charlotte's German cadence, methodical and rhythmic, high-pitched, anxious, and I think not really such a warm person. Remarkably, the material allows me to see the private side of Governor Wächter's nefarious work in Krakow and Lemberg from 1939 to 1944. What exactly did he do? Why did he travel to Rome in the spring of 1949? And what caused him to die there unexpectedly at a relatively young age? How much did Charlotte know about what he did? And what support did she provide? What was their relationship like? The material is voluminous, mostly handwritten. It lingers for many weeks until my colleague at UCL, the noted historian Lisa Jardine, intercedes. She's recently delivered an inaugural lecture with the title, Temptation in the Archives. Her interest is, how do you assess archival material of a personal nature? What's the historical value of personal documents? Lisa is by now very ill, but she summons a few of us to her flat in the shadow of the British Museum. Bring a few documents, she says. She gravitates towards the personal correspondence and diaries. She's struck by the sheer number of letters written in the last months of Otto's life while he's on the run, indicted, a hunted man. Why would a husband and wife write to each other so often, at such length and in such detail, she asks? Because they loved each other, I'd venture? No, she says, there's more there, sharing things they don't want others to see. The letters from the last years after the war, while Otto was on the run, are coded. There are many people, there are no names. Focus on the last years of Otto's life, Lisa suggests, and focus on Charlotte's role. And so begins another research project, one that lasts years, an exploration of what lies between the lines and behind the words. And I stumble into a world of escape and espionage, of double dealing and duplicity, of exhumations and reburials, traveling from the Vatican to Syria and South America into monasteries, over lakes, across mountains. And finally, I enter the world of the rat line, the Reich migratory route, as some called it, the escape route used by the Nazis to make their way from Italy to Argentina and other places. What I will learn is barely imaginable, but it's fact, not fiction. It's a story of love and lies and justice, of a couple fleeing from the prospect of discovery and arrest, for the worst crimes imaginable, of charge and trial, of sentencing and the inevitable news. At the heart of the story is a relationship, one that survived, Charlotte Wechter believed, because our love was without any limits and even went beyond death. Charlotte fascinates and repels. She was born into a wealthy family of steelmakers in the small Styrian town of Mürzuschlag and was, on her own account, a very difficult and rebellious child, intelligent, but not intellectual. She was a student at the Women's Academy and School for Free and Applied Art. She developed a fine artistic eye, and she was taught by teachers like Joseph Hoffman of the Wiener Werkstätte. Her career blossomed. She designed fabrics and sold them with success in Germany and Britain. She was a fine sportswoman, and in the spring of 1929, she traveled to the local Schneeberg ski resort and shared a train compartment with a stranger, a striking young lawyer. 
My new baron, she called him, tall, slender, athletic, with delicate features and very beautiful hands. He wore a diamond ring on the little finger of his right hand and had a noble appearance, one that any girl would notice. 6th of April, she writes in her diary, I fell in love with good-looking, cheerful Otto. They courted for three years before they married, a result of her pregnancy. He starts to practice as a lawyer and becomes increasingly active in the banned Austrian chapter of the Nazi party. She supports and encourages his politics. In the summer of 1934, Otto leads the unsuccessful coup attempt on the government of Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus, who is killed. He flees to Berlin and he joins the criminal division of the Sicherheitsdienst, or the SD, the intelligence service of the SS. He works in the same building as Adolf Eichmann and enters the orbit of Heinrich Himmler, who becomes his patron. Charlotte joins him in Berlin in 1936 with Horst's two oldest siblings. In March 1938, Germany seizes Austria and the two and the children are able to return home. Every Nazi felt such joy about this miracle, Charlotte records. She drives to Vienna to pave the way for her husband's return. And there he was in the doorway of my parents' flat in Vienna as a Brigadeführer in his black SS coat with white lapels and SS uniform. In spite of the strain and the fatigue, he looked splendid. Those are her memoirs. They make their way to the Hofburg Palace through crowds overcome with a spontaneous and heartfelt outburst of joy. Sai Sinkvat and his wife and a number of others came with the Fuhrer who slowly climbed the stairs of the Hofburg up to the balcony. And there he was, the Fuhrer, standing a meter in front of me and I could see and hear him well. At the bottom of the stairs of the Hofburg, after the joy, she tells Otto, accept Sais's offer of a senior job in the new Nazi government. Don't go back to the life of a lawyer. That single decision would have huge consequences. It will change their lives and it will change the lives of their children and grandchildren forever. Charlotte's diaries pass in total silence on what Otto actually did. As a state secretary, his function was to remove Jews and other undesirables from public office. From the top, the federal chancellery, to the bottom, mere postal workers. He axed thousands and thousands of individuals. Incredibly, even two of his own university teachers, Professor Joseph Hupke and Professor Stefan Braslov, removed from their university positions in the summer of 1938 by Otto Wächter, both lost their pension rights and their jobs, and in due course, both professors were deported to their deaths. As Otto crosses lines, Charlotte offers unstinting support. She just loves the perks, the Mercedes, the cocktail parties, the concerts at the Salzburg Festival, and Bayreuth in the presence of the Fuhrer and Himmler and she appreciates the new homes, freshly emptied and appropriated. In Vienna, a large villa with its own park. At Lake Zell, a small summer house with 16 hectares, previously owned by the governor of Salzburg, who's now languishing at Ravensbrück concentration camp. The arrival of war in September 1939 propels Otto's career to even greater heights and horrors. Seiss Inkwart procures a new position for Otto as governor of Krakow in Western Poland, newly occupied by Germany, and he works directly under Hans Frank. Charlotte is fully aware of what he was up to. Why do I say that? Because he wrote about it in the letters home, and we have the letters. There's a lot going on here, Otto writes in December 1939, and tomorrow I have to have another 50 poles publicly shot. This was a first and notorious act of reprisal killing, personally ordered by Hitler. It was Otto Wächter who signed off on all the acts against the city's Jews and Polish intellectuals. It was he who ordered and oversaw the construction of the Krakow ghetto. For these and other acts, he will later be indicted for mass murder, for crimes against humanity and genocide. I look for any hint of regret in Charlotte's papers, 8,677 pages, but there is no sign, nothing. Three years later, 
the Krakow job completed, Charlotte celebrates when Hitler appoints Otto to Lemberg to clean up district Galicia, recently occupied by Germany. And Otto, in his letters home, keeps her abreast of developments. There was so much to do in Lemberg after you left. The harvest was gathered, Polish workers were sent to labor camps, already more than 250,000 sent from the district. And the current large Jewish operations, the Juden Aktionen, have been implemented. Lots of love forever, Heil Hitler. Himmler visits, offers him a position in Vienna if he doesn't want to stay, but Otto decides to, say, to stay. I was almost embarrassed about how positively Himmler talks about me, Otto reports to Charlotte. But life isn't totally perfect. Manual labor is proving to be difficult to find as the Jews are being deported in increasing numbers and it's hard to get powder for the tennis court. As the deportations and exterminations proceed, Charlotte writes of picnics and concerts. It is this disconnect between the horror and the beauty that makes for so compelling and terribly disconcerting a read. Carefully read, Charlotte's diaries reveal other secrets. Working as a volunteer nurse at a hospital in Lviv, she records in English so that Otto can't read her diary that she has lost her heart to a young soldier. And then in the spring of 1942, as the final solution is being implemented, she falls in love with Otto's boss, Hans Frank. I send these pages of the diary to Frank's son, Nicholas. Sensational, he responds by a mischievous email in return. Perhaps Otto and I, perhaps Horst and I are brothers. The letter traces the bitter last months and weeks of war. And even at the most acute moments, as the Red Army approaches Lemberg and the end nears, Charlotte and Otto find time to write to each other twice, three times a week, and still to hope. Ever the Anglophile, for Charlotte loves Britain. She says the great thing about the English is they are even more nationalist than the Germans. That's a letter from 1932. She imagines the possibility in 1945 of a new ally in the struggle against the dreaded Soviets. I hope that the English will be fed up and unite with us, she writes. But there's an impediment, the Jews. They're always getting involved, always contaminating everything. Those are her words. On 9th of May, 45, the war is over. Otto's indicted for mass murder and promptly disappears. His name's in the papers, he's indicted, listed as a wanted war criminal with his friend Seiss Inkwart, who is caught, and as you know, put on trial at Nuremberg, convicted and executed. To survive, Otto must rely on Charlotte. And so the tables are turned. A new chapter opens, and now it is Charlotte who has the power. Evasion and escape require new friends and allies in the Vatican and beyond. And Charlotte's papers provide secret details of Otto's escape, including the time he spent in the Austrian mountains with a young companion, a former SS soldier, Burkhard Ratmann, known as Bucco. I asked Korsk about Bucco. What did he do during the war? What was he like? Why did he help Otto? You want to know about Bucco? Horst asks. I nod. Well, I can answer your questions and I can tell you all about Bucco, he continues, or we could telephone him. I was astonished. We did telephone him, and a few weeks later, we visited him. He told me how, 75 years earlier, they'd hidden in the Austrian mountains for three years, moving from hut to hut, following the Nuremberg trial in the newspapers that Charlotte brought to them every two or three weeks. They read of the outcome, the convictions, the sentences of death, the hangings of Otto's friends and colleagues, Frank, Seisinkvart, Kaltenpoiner, how did Otto react to the news of the hangings of his friends? I asked. Vi victis, Bucco says, to the victor, the spoiled. And as Bucco speaks to me, I have my eye on a small black and white photograph on his bookshelf. It's a seated man, pensive, with a swastika on an armband. Adolf Hitler, in January 2017, on a bookshelf at Bucco's. After Otto left Bucco in the summer of 48, he slowly made his way south via Salzburg and Innsbruck, then across the Dolomites into Italy. The correspondence with Charlotte 
provides much detail. The friends and lovers who provided refuge and other forms of assistance and comfort on the way in Bolzano and elsewhere. The dramatic arrival in Rome to be greeted by senior Vatican figures, including a very positive religious gentleman with whom he had connections right to the very top. From this correspondence, all anonymized, we, I, with tremendous research assistance from some remarkable young scholars, eventually worked out who he met and hung out with, what the Americans were up to in the Eternal City with the British, who their new friends and allies were, and how the new war, a Cold War, ensnared Otto Wächter, and what exactly the Americans and the British knew about his whereabouts and when. The path to the rat line has come into view, and it's a surprising and troubling one. So troubling, in fact, that I took counsel from my neighbor, the writer of spy novels, John le Carre. He invites me to tea. I arrive with six small cakes, a handful of Otto's letters, a few photographs. We sit in his living room as the sun streams in across the papers, laid out on a sofa and a low table. I was there in 1949, Le Carre tells me, which I didn't know, I was surprised. I was a young British soldier interrogating Nazis. For prosecution, I ask. No, he replies, to recruit them. It was bewildering. I'd been brought up to hate Nazism and all of that stuff, and all of a sudden to find that we turned on a sixpence and the great new enemy was to be the Soviet Union was extremely perplexing. The Nazis were our new friends. That was within just three years of the end of the Nuremberg trial, which offers a different sort of context. I've given you this story so you can begin to understand the project in which I've been engaged. And the question arises, why did I engage in it? What is it about the vectors that captured my imagination? There aren't any simple answers to those questions, but it seems clear to me that it goes to the interrelationship of matters of memory and identity. That's the case for Horst Wächter, the memorialization and construction of a positive image of his parents. And it's also the case for me, a journey that has taken me back to the untold story of my grandfather and his family so that I can better understand who he was, so that I can understand who I am. And memory and identity must have gone hand in hand for Isaiah Berlin also. In preparing this lecture, I read myself quite deeply into his engagement with some of the matters on which I've written. He spent the war years, as you will know, in the United States and on various accounts, though year, those years were the making of Isaiah Berlin, not least the remarkable individuals he met, and it could be said, the not so remarkable. In a letter to his parents, dated October the 17th, 1942, Isaiah Berlin describes Hirsch Lauterpacht, the founder of modern human rights law, the man who put crimes against humanity into the Nuremberg Statute and international law as a quintessentially dull Cambridge scholar. But it also seems that like Lauterpacht, Isaiah Berlin didn't want to engage actively with the subject of the Holocaust. And it may be that like Lauterpacht, this was connected to his sense of identity, what it means to be a Jew in Britain. There are many silences one commentator has observed of the totality of Isaiah Berlin's writing, suggesting that perhaps this silence went to his sense of Jewishness, which was for Berlin, as for Lauterpacht, complicated. This commentator writes, the greatest silence concerns the Holocaust, what he knew and what he said he didn't know or couldn't have known. And for Hirsch Lauterpacht too, this was a matter of silence, as it was also for my grandfather. And part of the reasons I suspect for the silence is about the creation of a sense of identity. There is memory, but how you use that memory and how you talk about that memory informs the nature of identity. To be sure, the memories existed, but they were to be kept in the shadows, perhaps for reasons of identity. Please understand this is in no way a critique. And having spent a lot of time working on these issues, including with so many people who lived through those terrible events, I fully understand why this was a period for so many of silence. But my own interest in the Vechters is surely a consequence of the connection 
he has with my own family. In Vienna and Lemberg, Wächter, the father, Otto, was directly involved in actions that contributed to the mistreatment, to the extermination of my grandfather's entire family. My own desire to excavate the memories of others is intended to fill gaps and replace the silences. And that's motivated in part by matters of identity, my own identity. And there is too the implications of Otto Wächter's story for my and our conceptions of justice, a matter which of course was of deep importance to Isaiah Berlin, along with liberty. Wächter died alone in the Vatican-run Santo Spiritu Hospital, charged, yes, but never convicted. And that failure of a conviction, of a trial, creates a space, and Horst has occupied that space. All the guilty ones have been judged, he once said to me. As far as he was concerned, the name of all those responsible for crimes had been fully documented, and since none of the lists of those tried and convicted included his father's name, it followed that he must be innocent. Everything else, Horst says, is a matter of imagination. It is the untold story of the Nuremberg trials and of every other expression of formalized international criminal justice, one of those unintended consequences of more or less every legislative or judicial act. Inclusio unius est exclusio alterius. To include one person is to exclude another person. By memorializing certain facts in the Nuremberg judgment by the silence, you inadvertently memorialize the acts of others by silencing their stories. And that silence allowed Charlotta to live the rest of her life on the entirely constructed and imaginary artifice that her husband was a decent man, a reality she then passed on to her son. But as those of you who've read The Rat Line will know, the baton of innocence is not necessarily passed on endlessly to all the future generations. There is, too, to explain my own interest in the Wächters, the connection to my own work and cases in which I'm involved. Indeed, I pondered these matters just a few months ago. I found myself sitting in the International Court of Justice in The Hague. I was counsel to the Gambia in the big case some of you will have read about involving the case against Myanmar and the allegations of genocide in relation to the Rohingya community. I found myself sitting just a few feet from Aung San Suu Kyi, Nobel Peace Laureate, as she sought to persuade the judges that the Myanmar military's actions against the Rohingya community might be excessive. The odd war crime here and there, perhaps, she acknowledged a bit grudgingly, but most certainly not acts of genocide. But none of the 17 judges was persuaded. How was it, I thought to myself, as she spoke, that she could not see the facts as others did? Some who know her believe the reason may lie in matters personal and of family arising from her relationship with her own father, the architect of Burmese independence, the founder of the Tat Mador, Myanmar's armed forces. He was assassinated six months before the country gained independence from the United Kingdom. As she addressed the court, just a few feet from me, looking impeccable, speaking so elegantly and fluently, I thought of Horst and Charlotte. And my interest in the Wächters as individuals, I suppose in some way that interest must be connected to the legal issues of crimes against humanity and genocide, for there are individuals and there is the group. And one of the groups, perhaps the most important group, is the group known as family. As regards Otto, I begin the rat line with a quote from the fine Spanish writer Javier Cercas. It is more important to understand the butcher than the victim. Why did Otto do what he did? This perhaps is the big question that I, like so many others, am chasing, and so many have chased it for years. How can it be that a highly intelligent, educated, he entered law school in Vienna actually on the same day as Hirsch Lauterpach, cultured human being could become embroiled in acts of mass murder? These are actually not questions for the judges, of course, who are only concerned with what he did and did not do. But can we, who are so interested in the formalized delivery of criminal justice, also not ask what is surely the bigger question, the why, the warum, the pourquoi? 
The answers to such questions do not reside in the judgments of courts. They live in the personal archives, in the letters and the diaries, in the poems and in the notes. In the Vecht correspondence, we can find clues. We see how he crossed lines. We can spot that toxic combination of ideology, ambition and weakness. And there's another conclusion from the private material. This is not a matter of the banality of evil, to take Hannah Arendt's words. Otto Vechter knew exactly what he was doing. He embraced the horror, he supported it. And the silence of the documents is testament of his own awareness. And what of Charlotte? In many ways, she's the most fascinating of the characters, the beating heart of the story, beating heart of this family story of international and familial criminality. It's plain from her own massive archive that she knew everything, that she was, in a sense, complicit. But she loved her man, and even though she was angry with him, she supported him. And Horst. Horst is in a state of absolute denial on that which is in the archive and that which I have dug up to fill the gaps. How do we understand the nature of a son's denial? Love blinds. Over time, it transforms perception of reality and then reality itself. Like me, Horst was born into a family of silences. When the war ended, he, as Charlotte's favorite of six children, was protected, nourished and loved. And he was taught that his father was a fine man. I do not want my children to believe that Otto Wechter is a war criminal who murdered hundreds of Jews. Charlotte Wechter writes, in her reminiscences. And Horst doesn't want to believe it either, even if he knows the facts point elsewhere. Together, he and I have stood before a site of mass murder in the small town of Zhulkiev, near Lviv. And there, the pain on his face is plain. He doesn't deny what happened. He doesn't deny his father's connection to the horrors. He doesn't deny his mother's support for them. He just wants to characterize them differently, just like Charlotte did. It's just a way of being able to live. It's a means of survival. Tomorrow, I have to have 50 poles publicly shot, Otto wrote to Charlotte. Horst's interpretation, he says to me with a straight face. You see, it says, I have to have them shot, but I want to have them shot. You have no proof, he would constantly tell me. And so I found the proof. It took three years, including three dreadful photographs my place at the end of the book, of Otto Wechter overseeing that act of execution. A first photograph shows a group of 25 young men and boys in the snow awaiting their own execution. A second shows the act of execution, and a third shows Otto present, the commanding presence, in his fine, long, black leather coat. I cannot share Horst's characterization of the facts, but I feel an affection for him and I respect his open spirit, his willingness to engage in this project with me, to respond to suggestions that the looted objects his mother passed on to him should be returned to their rightful owners, and for the most part he has now returned them. I feel too anxiety for the price he has paid for sharing all these personal papers with me, cutting himself off in the course from much of the rest of his family. If I'm able to be generous to him, he who protects the reputation of the father who was so deeply involved in the killing of my grandfather's family. It's because I constantly recall a scene early in the film, My Nazi Legacy, April 1945, Horst's sixth birthday. He weeps as he tells me the story of that moment. And the consequences go on and on, these issues of memory and identity and the construction of relations between the individual and the group, the individual and the family. I opened East West Street with a quote from Nicholas Abraham and Maria Torok, two Hungarian psychoanalysts. Their book, Notes on the Phantom, was concerned with the effects on descendants of injury or catastrophe that is felt by grandparents. And that is a major theme of what I'm trying to understand. The last words in this new book are spoken by Magdalena, the granddaughter of Otto and Charlotte, the only child of Horst. My grandfather was a mass murderer, she says to me 
They are the closing words of the book, and they have caused Horst to disinherit his own daughter. Yet Horst and I are bonded by a sense of dislocation and to events distant in time and place. Our points of departure were different. We represent opposite sides of a story, but it's a shared story. Our paths crossed and we arrived at an end point. It's been a curious waltz. It's a constant movement, a double act, in which each seeks to lead and persuade the other. But what emerges are secrets and questions of lies and justice and love and what they mean and what they do to our own sense of memory and identity, and hence our sense of liberty and of justice, is another matter entirely. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Professor Sands, that was absolutely fascinating, and your own personal interest in it is completely fascinating. We have several questions, um, so I'm going to take the first one is from Ruth Bria, who says, our ancestors have suffered so much and today there is still a lot of anti-Semitism. Is this a case of there being nothing new under the sun? I mean, you have talked about why did Otto do this? How could he do this as an intelligent man? So how is it anti-Semitism and genocide on a more general level is always present? Well, that is a question not for a lawyer or even a historian, but probably for a psychologist, a psychoanalyst, a psychiatrist. Why do these ancient hatreds bubble up? Um, I, I mean, it is plain that there is you know, racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, populism. It's all in vogue right now. And we are possibly on the cusp of some pretty bad things in some parts of the world. Bad things are already happening, we're aware of that. And yet, it isn't exactly the same. We do now have pieces of paper out there, they're called treaties, which say that there are certain forms of behavior that cannot be tolerated or accepted. And just to share briefly one quick anecdote. I described in the lecture, my participation touched on in the case involving allegations of genocide by Myanmar against the Rohingya community in its own country. The day before that, the week before that hearing, I was in Washington, DC, uh, and I was giving a, doing a seminar with a very dear friend of mine, a man called Thomas Bergenthal. He's written an incredible book actually, which some of you will have read called A Lucky Child. He was a judge at the International Court of Justice, but in his childhood, he was at Auschwitz and he was in the care of Joseph Mengele. And in the course of the seminar, he said to me, Philippe, how amazing that next week you're going to be in The Hague and you will argue a case about genocide involving the treatment of the Rohingya community in Myanmar. Can you imagine if back in 1944, when I was at Auschwitz, there had been an international court and some other country would have taken Germany to that court and made allegations? It's unimaginable to me that that could have happened then how extraordinary that it happens now. So yes, these things still go on, but bit by bit, very slowly, incrementally, we are constructing the tools to address these issues. Thank you. Um, on a more personal level, Max asks, how did you deal with your situation emotionally, given your identity as a descendant of victims dealing with an apologetic descendant of a leading perpetrator. So how did you deal with Otto's son, Horst? How are you dealing with it? That's a wonderful question. I mean, it's been, it's been as you can understand, very difficult. Some people um, may have seen the film My Nazi Legacy, made by my dear friend David Evans, um, who captured the single moment that I lost my rag with Horst Fechter and did so in front of cameras, which was my perspective, not ideal. It was a matter for David to decide it's his film and he put it in the film. And I feel uncomfortable about that. I think in a sense, I've been fortunate in that my training as an academic, but also as a barrister who does a lot of cases involving murder on a horrendous scale, killings on a horrendous scale, I've learned to distance myself and to speak to people with some degree of distance. But of course that becomes much more difficult when you are with um, 
the son of uh, someone like Nicholas Frank or Horst Wächter, whose father was so directly involved in what befell my grandfather's family. I tell myself that the sons are not responsible for the acts of the fathers, and neither of them condone what the fathers did. That is very important for me. And because a horse is neither anti-Semitic nor a denier of the Holocaust, it is possible in a certain way to have a conversation with him. But as you can imagine, at some point in the conversation, when I've presented him with direct evidence of his father's own involvement, and he just turns away from it, that I do find very, very difficult. And then my training, I suppose as a lawyer and as an academic, cuts in and I try to keep the conversation going. So it's it's not easy. Sometimes it's really not easy, but somehow we've managed it. We're still in touch. That's, that's some uh, achievement. Um, <laughs> but as you say, your training is a QC. I'm sure in court you have to learn to keep your cool, whatever may, might be well, going yeah, on. Judges, judges don't like it when you lose your cool. They're not interested in your own emotions. They're not interested in your own views. And I've written both the books and indeed this lecture where I sort of go through a semi-distancing exercise in order to basically grapple with the horror. In a, in a sense, it's, a, it's an English technique or British technique, yes. understatement in writing. You're familiar with that. And in many ways, I think it may be more powerful and it may mean you reach a bigger audience. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Wendy Dryden. Um, a legal question. In law, how does one prove intent to commit genocide? Uh, what a terrific question. What a, what a difficult, difficult issue. Well, Wendy. <sighs> In an ideal world, mass murderers or genocidaires would leave bits of paper around saying, we are killing these people because they are a member of X group and we want to get rid of that group. Very few people in history have done that. The Nazis did it, and that made the trials against them much easier. But people have learned, don't do that. And so you are left to... Um, identify genocidal intent from a to infer it from a pattern of behavior and the standard that has been set by international courts is a very high standard it basically said it must be the only reasonable inference to be drawn from a pattern of behavior and that's why it's difficult to prove it was proven for example in relation to Srebrenica it's been proven in relation to parts of the things that happen in Cambodia. It was not proven in relation to Vukovar. You gather the evidence and you stand up before a court and you seek to persuade the judges that the only reasonable inference from the pattern of behavior, its timing, its scale, the, the forms of behavior that accompanied it, lead you inevitably the conclusion it was intended to destroy the group in whole or in part but it's very, very difficult to prove that. Right. Good luck with it then. It's uh, so, so important. Our next question is from Amanda Bowman. Uh, she says, we read today about the apology that Roald Dahl's family made for his anti-Semitic remarks and beliefs. They said these prejudiced remarks stand in marked contrast to the man we knew. Do you see any parallels? Well, I read the piece actually in today's paper, and uh, and I, you know, it's a story I've sort of followed. But seeing some of the things he said quoted in black and white, it's really pretty chilling. Um, and again, it comes back to the question I asked in the lecture: um, How is it that um, you know, a highly intelligent? A highly educated, highly cultured individual would hold such views. Um, I think that all of these stories have parallels. Um, how a child does not does not see or grandchild what the parent or grandparent has done is pretty tough. You know, I often ask myself the question, Having met Nicholas Frank, for example, 
how would I feel towards my father or my grandfather if that person had been hanged for murdering four million human beings, a million Poles and three million Jews? Would I still love that person as my father or would I react as Nick Frank has reacted? Would I react rather as Horst Vechter reacted? It's, it's very, very difficult um, to know how I would react. And I think one of the things I've tried to do in addressing these issues is not judge the next generations for how they respond, because I don't know how I would respond. I mean, on the other side of the story are the silences of why people did, or in most cases did not speak, if they had been through certain matters. And it was a great interest for me to read various academic articles on Isaiah Berlin's own engagement and the question of what he knew while he was working at the British Embassy in Washington, you know, in 1942, 1943, 1944. Um, and his own characterization of that, basically an argument that he did not know, academics today with the benefit of hindsight say that's pretty tough to understand and justify. But what you learn from my perspective is not to second guess why people approach things as they do. I think my role is simply to report and reasonable and intelligent readers will form their own view as to the merits, the justifications and the difficulties. But um, I can quite see why the next generations of the Dals would say that it's a way of living with the reality of your own family and I don't judge it because I don't know enough about the precise facts. But it, it, it is, I think, a, it is a comparable type of way of dealing with the sins of the grandparent or the parent. It's a pretty tough thing to deal with. Thank you. Um, Raphael Ellis Rubin asks, having worked with new instances of mass atrocities, would you say that the world learned nothing from the Holocaust? What strategy could effectively prevent them, as we say all the time, never again? Well, one of the things that I've come to understand is that acts of mass murder, genocide, crimes against humanity, are not things that happen in single instances. They are preceded by patterns of behavior where one thing leads to another. It always begins with the identification of a group as the other and a detestation of that group. And the discriminations or the mistreatments to begin with may be relatively minor or insignificant. But to give you an example, which I think happily is now about to be brought to an end, when President Trump back in 2017 issued an executive order banning Muslims from certain countries from entering the United States simply because they were Muslims, not because they were alleged to have done anything. That is a, an act which gets my alarm bells ringing because it is the act of characterizing an entire group of people as being nefarious, negative, requiring action, not because of what they've done, because of, but because of who they happen to be. And I think the US courts and Congress effectively moved pretty quickly to check, not all, but some of that excess. And I think we know from other kinds of cases that this is how these kinds of things begin. Frankly, in the domestic context, it's, it's the same thing when a Home Secretary starts labelling certain categories of lawyers as being, you know, acting unacceptably, or in the context of certain judges simply trying to do their job, labelling them as enemies of the people. These are very familiar tropes to anyone who works in the field and sees how one thing leads to another. And I think that's why we have learned a lot. 
And one of the things that we've learned is we have to act very hard and very decisively in relation to addressing that issue, which is why, for example, the issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party has been such a concern. It has to be addressed. I know Keir Starmer well. He is addressing it and he will address it. But you can't turn a blind eye to any of these kinds of things, whether it is anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, homophobia. One thing leads to another. That is what we know. The more difficult question is how you action steps to prevent the next thing from occurring. And that's not so easy. We did actually have a question about what advice would you give Keir Starmer um, because of the situation of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Have you got anything you would like to add or you obviously well, said you're in, t in touch with him and know him well? Well, I mean, I, I think I think he doesn't need advice from me on that. I think his <laughs> own instincts. You know, he and I did a genocide case together. We acted for Croatia against Serbia for several years, the International Court of Justice. So I know that he is deeply knowledgeable of these matters of history and also of how these things begin. Um, and so he and others will understand that, that there's just no room for manoeuvre. You know, the moment you spot something, whether it's in the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, you need to move very, very fast to address it because the failure to address it effectively sends a signal that that kind of behaviour is tolerated to a certain extent, and it is allowed to grow. So the modalities, the precise modalities of how you deal with it, I think are complex and reasonable people will disagree about what exactly you have to do. But the do nothing option, the turning a blind eye option is absolutely not acceptable because it will inevitably lead to the next stage. If you go back over the rat line, you will see that in the case of Otto Wächter, you can understand his life story as a series of lines crossed. And every time a line was crossed, it started off fairly innocuously, and then it ends up with mass murder. The skies did not fall in on him. And one of the lessons I've wanted to tell with that book is the moment you cross a line, the heavens must fall, and you have to address it. Because otherwise, individuals who are liable to cross lines will logically go to the next line. But how you do it is often very complex. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Alfred Burton, who asks, and you've already talked a bit about the states, this puts the states in a different light. To what extent are current human rights protections and the power of the ICJ underpinned by US hegemony? And how will the rise of China and India affect these? Well, you know, you know Madeleine, I, just two weeks ago, I had the great privilege of being invited by the president of Germany to attend the commemoration in Nuremberg's courtroom 600 of the opening day of the Nuremberg trial. And it was really quite something I have to say as someone whose great grandmother and grandparents and that generation suffered very greatly at the hands of the then German government to be there with the president uh, of Germany. And one of the things we talked about was, and he talked about, and I agreed with him, was how much we need the United States back um, warts and all, the United States has provided tremendous leadership on the idea of an international rule of law, on rights of individuals, rights of groups. And I think for many people, myself included, the last four years have been extremely painful. Uh, the United States has abdicated the global stage. And I hope that the United States will now come back it won't be exactly the same as before, but I think that the president-elect is someone who imbibes the values that led the United States to do what it did in 1945. Ch China is a very complex story. You know, I may surprise you here. It is absolutely true that on matters of human rights, uh, the Chinese government is not to be trusted. What We've seen what is going on in Hong Kong. We've seen the allegations of 
the treatment, the mistreatment of the Uyghurs, whether it's crime against humanity or genocide, I don't know enough about the facts, but whatever it is, it looks pretty bad. But interestingly, on other aspects of the rule of law, particularly on economic relations, trade, foreign investment, China is a big believer in the rule of law because it's very heavily exposed. And so my hope is that over time, China will come to see that you can't have a sort of a la carte commitment to the rule of law. There's bits of it you like and bits of it you don't. Um, and I try to be hopeful uh, about China and various other uh, countries. And there are many people in China, including in the Chinese government, who are very strongly committed to a change of approach. But I do think that over time, having the United States playing that role is extremely important. I should say, since I'm on the subject, I am extremely concerned when it comes to the rule of law about positions taken by the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has been an absolute stalwart supporter of bodies like the International Court of Justice and the idea of the rule of law. And I think it is tragic that in the last couple of years, it has moved away from that position. Many of you will not be aware that last year, the United Kingdom was on a receiving end uh, of a decision of the International Court of Justice in relation to a place called Chagos, which it was deemed by the court to be occupying illegally and must give back to um, Mauritius for disclosure purposes. I'm counsel for Mauritius in that case. And the British government has decided it's not going to do that, which, which I think is it's very bad. But many of you will be aware that this week there's going to be a lot in the news about something called the Internal Markets Bill. And you should know that the legislation that this government has put before Parliament to violate the withdrawal agreement from the European Union is the first time in history that any British government has laid legislation before Parliament which on its face violates international law. And that is deeply damaging of Britain's reputation around the world. And Britain will pay a very big price for that. So I'm hoping that that falls away this week. But it's it's not a great place um, that Britain has placed itself right now on the rule of law, I'm afraid. I'm not making a party political point. Uh, many of you will know that when a Labour Prime Minister chose to invade Iraq, I spoke out very strongly against that. I'm making a broader point. We as a country should have an absolutely strong commitment to the idea of the rule of law domestically and internationally. And that's our view of British justice, that it is um, stands for everything. So that's really important. Um, we have a question relating back to Isaiah Berlin's uh, writing from Helmut Scorn. I agree that Arendt's banality of evil cannot explain the cases you describe. Do you think there is something in Berlin's philosophical writings that may shed some light on them? Well, I think there is a connection. I mean, I am not an expert on Isaiah Berlin's okay. writings, their totality. Some I've read quite closely, as you know, he had a particular commitment to the idea of the liberty of the individual. But he recognized that that liberty had to be subject to certain constraints. The liberty of the individual was not absolute. He wrote, as many of you know, about positive freedoms and negative freedoms. And it was for him a balancing exercise. The heart of much of his philosophy is about the relationship between the individual and the society of which she and he is a member. The groups from the tiniest, the family, through to a community, a town, through to a country, through to international organizations. That is a fantastically complex set of issues. Um, so, I think there is absolutely a connection between the individual stories that I've talked about this evening and the broader philosophical writings of Isaiah Berlin. He, I assume, would be asking himself the question if presented with the life story of Otto and Charlotte Wächter. When they crossed lines, in what ways were they abusing the liberties 
that ideas of personal and individual freedom allow us, each of us as individuals. I don't know how he would have answered the question in terms of the precision of the answer, but he would have been deeply familiar with the question in relation to matters of individual responsibility when you face a personal crossroads. But I think of it in similar terms. I teach international law, I teach at University of London, and one of the issues a lot of my students will ask me, or young lawyers or barristers or solicitors will young, ask me, is what do I do if I'm asked to do something that crosses a line into illegality? What if I'm instructed to do something? And this is a, a really tough question. And it's a question of almost individual personal morality, um, maintaining your sense of integrity and independence. And the question of the extent to which those constraints can be imposed from external sources or the extent to which they derive from an inner individual instinct is a deeply complex question. And the interrelationship between the inner instinct and the externally imposed constraint, how one informs the other or doesn't, is at the heart of this interesting question that has just been asked. And it's a complex question. Why we do what we do and what causes us not to cross lines? Is it the formality of the law? Is it some moral instinct? Is it an external force? Or does it come purely from the internal? Are fascinating and complex questions that were at the heart of Berlin's writings. Well, I'd, I'd like to end there because that's um, absolutely the heart of your writings and Isaiah Berlin's. But I'm going to ask one more question, a practical question. Mm -hmm. um, we've had from both Anna, Eleanor Lint and Anna Gordon. Are you working at present on a follow up to your two books? Will there be another book? I, I am. Um, I'm going to have a short book that will come out, which is not, as, not in relation to these two uh, in 2022 in September on colonialism, decolonization in the Chagos case. That would be a slim volume, you'll be glad to know, no more than 40,000 words. A series of lectures I'm giving in summer of 2022, that'll come out as a book. But the third in the sequel, East West Street and the Rat Line, will come out in September 2024. I've started writing it, or researching it, certainly. And just as Otto Wächter was a bit part character in East West Street, there is a bit part character in the rat line uh, who is called Walter Rauf. And Walter Rauf, like Wächter, was a senior SS officer, not governor, so slightly lower down the pecking scale. And like Wächter, he fled to Rome. He was hidden by a well-known bishop in the same monastery where Wächter was hidden. He left for Syria in 1949, eventually made his way to Chile in 1955. And it is said that in 1973, he became uh, an interrogator stroke torturer for Senator Pinochet's, General Pinochet's regime. And 25 years later, his story and some of the cases he was involved in landed on my desk when Senator Pinochet, as he then was, was arrested in London. So the third, and I, my wife hopes, the final book in the period <laughs> will be the double story of Walter Rauch in Chile in 1973 and the arrest of Senator Pinochet in London in 1998. And there's a certain point of connection because people uh, are not aware that when Senator Pinochet was arrested in London on the 16th of October 1998, he was arrested for crimes against humanity and genocide. Um, and so it is an absolutely complete if you like, of the circle that begins in Lemberg in 1904. I think that will be the end of the trilogy. Yes, I hope I hope that completes the circle for you. Right, thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Henry Grunwald for the thank yous. Henry. Philippe, you have made this evening absolutely fascinating for everyone who's been watching and listening. Now, I, I, I've had the privilege of hearing you speak before and I, I, I don't know anyone 
and you, you touched on it tonight, who can explain the complexities of the laws of genocide and of crimes against humanity in the way that you can. And that's one part of your being, the academic lecturer. The other is as the international lawyer, you go to the international court all over the world. I go to Idlewood Crown Court to defend people charged with conspiring to burgle Tamara Ecclestone's houses. Very, very different. But the principles of law are the same and we're both deeply rooted in them. And you're an internationally renowned advocate. And in recent years, you've become the most fantastic author and storyteller. And you've proved that tonight by the, the fascinating lecture that you've given. There are many more questions which, if time permitted, could have been asked that have come in from people who are listening and who are so taken by what you've said. This has been a fantastic week for Hampstead Synagogue. One week ago, we had a, a full day from international academics and, and Rabonim uh, to mark the 25 years of Rabbi Michael with us as a community. We've ended this week with you giving the 18th Isaiah Berlin lecture. And you know, you stand so well in the company of all of those distinguished people who have gone before you. And for that, I thank you. It's been my privilege to give 17 of the 18 votes of thanks over the years. One year I was away, but I feel personally really grateful to have been able to do this for you tonight and to, to come back and end with something from Isaiah in one of his most popular essays, The Hedgehog and the Fox, which was published in 1953, he divides writers and thinkers into two categories. Hedgehogs view the world through the lens of a single defining idea and foxes who draw on a wide variety of experiences and for whom the world cannot be boiled down to a single idea. You are undoubtedly a fox and not a hedgehog. And for sharing your Fox abilities with us tonight on behalf of everyone watching and listening. I thank you very, very deeply. Madeleine delivered a, a little gift as a token of our appreciation to your house earlier this evening. We hope that you enjoy it. And I'm now going to hand back to her to end the evening. But thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much for what you said. Well, thank you, um, Philippe. We are really privileged to have heard that. And I'm personally very privileged to have been able to throw questions at you. And as Henry said, there were masses more. Um, but it's half past nine and that's probably enough. Everybody is zoomed out generally as a nation. Um, uh, thank you so much from Hampstead Synagogue and from Professor Philippe Sams. This is goodbye and good night. The uh, tonight's um, lecture has been recorded and is an available, will be available on exactly the same YouTube channel that you um, got the link on originally. So if you want to pass it on to friends or want to watch it again, it will be available um, for all afterwards. Thank you very much again, Professor Sands, and good night, everybody. Good night.